At first, it is a geographical term, not in India. It's a Persian term. Hindu is the phonetic equivalent of Sindhu. Sindhu is the Indus River. So, um, it means people living on or beyond the Indus River, looking at it from Iran. What is a pagan? So in Latin, the word paganus originally means rustic, you know, of the countryside. It means a village bumpkin. It comes from the word pagus, which means field. Uh, the Germanic equivalence is, equivalent is heathen, an inhabitant of the heath, again, of the countryside. So it has the same meaning, rustic backwards. What is the practical criterion for being a pagan? It's that you go to hell. In um, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar's foundational booklet, Hindu Twa, you have more or less the same definition. One for whom India is both fatherland and holy land. So he has to be Indian. And it's sects, it's uh, sampradayas. Let's define the term Hindu. So at first it is a geographical term, not in India. It's a Persian term. Hindu is the phonetic equivalent of Sindhu. Sindhu is the Indus River. So um, it means people living on or beyond the Indus River, looking at it from Iran. So um, some people, uh, like the RSS nowadays, uses this to underpin the rather ludicrous idea that every Indian is a Hindu. So in this ancient Persian definition, yes, of course, there was no one else in India except Hindus. Now, um, when the Muslim invaders came, they used the same term. They brought it into India. From then on, it was part of Indian language's vocabulary, though in the beginning only marginally. And they immediately gave it a new meaning. So from its first day in India, it had the meaning of every Indian who is not a Muslim. You know, then later it was a bit refined when they discovered there were also Christians and Jews in India, categories that the Muslims already knew. Uh, but so more generally, it means an Indian unbeliever, an Indian pagan. And this includes uh, every possible category of pagans in India. What is a pagan? So in Latin, the word paganus originally means rustic, you know, of the countryside. It means a village bumpkin. It comes from the word pagus, which means field. Uh, the Germanic equivalent is, equivalent is heathen, an inhabitant of the heath, again, of the countryside. So it has the same meaning, rustic backwards. Now, when Christianity is spread in the Roman Empire and then in the Germanic countries, it spread in the cities, in the population centers where the preachers could reach a lot of people. And so the, the countryside remained pagan for much longer. The countryside at the same time, of course, was the area of village bumpkins, we didn't share to the same extent in all the progress that the Roman culture was making. So these two meanings overlap of backward and of non-Christian. In uh, Islam, you get the same process with the word kafir. Kafir really, uh, literally means ungrateful. So you see, not accepting of the gift of Islam a refuser of Islam. And so the word kafir, plural in Arabic, kufar, or kafirun, both exist. Um, so uh, that comes to be used as every non-Muslim. 
Then you also get, you know, a special category for Christians and Jews, namely Dimi, those who follow the um, the the covenant, um, uh, those who profit from the charter of toleration. You see, Muslims find it very tolerant of them that they allow Christians and Jews to survive on condition of paying a special tax and observing a number of uh, humiliating rules. Um, but so uh, kafir essentially has the same meaning as pagan. It means an unbeliever. What is the practical criterion for being a pagan? It's that you go to hell. Now, who in India goes to hell? You see, some, some Hindu socialites nowadays, very status conscious, they feel, oh, no, 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 I'm not a pagan. You know, those other pagans, let them go to hell. But me, I, I want special privileges. Well, you see, you don't have to choose. You know, I mean, you have no choice in the matter. Christians have decided that you are a pagan, and there's nothing you can do about it. It is like, you see, somebody stands with his face to the south. So this means that he has the east on his left and the west to his right. Now, there's someone in the east. You see one of these Apiti Hindus who says, no, no, I don't want to be on your left. I want to be on your right. Now, you see, you, there's nothing you can do. What, what the, the other guy can do something. If he turns around, then you are to his right. Or actually, there is something you can do, but you have to take a lot more steps than he. Namely, you cross over from his left to his right. You know, or you know, to use the metaphor, you convert to Christianity. You know, you walk over to the other side. Okay, so then you're no longer a pagan. That's what you can do. But ultimately, it's he who decides who a pagan is and who isn't. Now, a pagan does not have to do anything in Christian theology with being backward. You see, this is where the word originates, the backward people, the village bumpkins, okay? But in Christianity, it acquires the meaning of non-Christian, any non-Christian. So Socrates or Aristotle are systematically referred to as pagan philosophers. And similarly, Shankara, the Buddha, Rama, and so on, or in other cultures, Confucius, Lao Tzu, and so on, they're all pagans. They may be as refined as they want, they may be as you know, morally upright as they want, righteous, whatever, doesn't help. They're going to help. You know, when, when Dante, Dante Alighieri writes his uh, Divina Commedia, so uh, he's taken around on a, on a guided tour through hell, and his guide is Virgil. Now, Virgil is very much appreciated by medieval Christians because he has written a poem announcing the birth of a Roman emperor, which Christians misinterpret as announcing the birth of Jesus. So, you see, he's one of those pagans that prepare the ground for Christianity. You know, that's something, that's just a principle that is applied in India. You see, Mahatma Gandhi, for example, is also appreciated as a Hindu who was an almost Christian. And um, <clears throat> so Virgil is appreciated, but nevertheless, he can guide the other guy through hell because he is in hell. No matter how good he is, he is not a Christian, therefore he is in hell. Simple. Um, so you are all going to hell. And me, I'm not going to hell. Yeah, I'm not really a Christian anymore, but I've been baptized. And according to theology, that's what you need to go to, to heaven. And so, so in my country, there, is this, there are very many ex-Christians. And so some of them would like to formalize it. And they have this unbaptizing ceremony. And so they have written to the bishops, OK, we want to be scrapped from the baptism register. The bishops say, well, you know, you, you can have your fun in your little party, and maybe we can even scrap you from the register. But nevertheless, theologically, 
Once baptized, always baptized. We can't unbaptize you. So that's why, you see, whatever I do, I go to heaven. <laughs> and you know, you go to hell unless you convert. But, you know, I, you know, I would like to put you at ease about the prospect of hell. You'll like it there. You see, the landlord in hell, he's a fellow with a trident. Yeah, so so you, you do feel at home. And then you have this constant fire burning there. It's an eternal Agnihotra. So for Hindus, it's a good place. Enjoy it in hell. Okay. But so the consequence is that all sects in India, Jains, Buddhists, Charvakas, uh, tribals, and so on, they're all Hindu. There's no discussion about this. You know, whatever they exactly believe, it may be anti-Vedic, for example, that doesn't help. They are still Hindu because they are still going to hell. Um, also, many sects that didn't exist yet, like uh, the Sikhs, the Vira Shaivas, the Iskom, the Arya Samaj, the Ramakrishna Mission. You see, they may all go to court and claim that they are not Hindus. And whatever the court decides, they are Hindus. And all these scheduled castes or scheduled tribe sects that we now hear about, like the Kabir Pant, the Adi Dharma, which is a, a, a scheduled caste uh, group around uh, Guru Ravidas or Sant Ravidas, the Sarna, which is the, the tribal religion of uh, Jharkhand, or Don Polo, the tribal religion of. Uh, Arunachal Pradesh, they have recently been recognized by their state governments as separate religions. Uh, so nevertheless, by this very simple original uh, definition of Hindu, they are Hindu. In um, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar's foundational booklet, Hindu Twa, you have more or less the same definition. One for whom India is both fatherland and holy land. So he has to be Indian. So again, whatever I believe or do or so, I'm not Hindu. And uh, he has to have India as his holy land. So people who go on pilgrimage to Mecca or to Rome or so, they're not Hindu. Even if they're born Indians. So you see the Buddhists, the tribals, the Sikhs, and so on, they all have their sacred sites in India. They're Hindus. Then in the Constitution, Article 35, you have the explanation, the reference to Hindus shall be construed as including a reference to persons professing the Sikh, Jaina, or Buddhist religions. Likewise, the Hindu uh, Marriage Act and so on in 1955-56, uh, they have the same definition. So Hindu law shall also extend to all these groups. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar observed correctly that all these intra-Hindu minorities have never had a law system of their own. They simply followed the existing Hindu law. Nevertheless, at the same time, they also have, or meanwhile have received, the status of minority, which brings with it a lot of privileges. <coughs> Okay, so the Hindus uh, were gradually getting used to this use of the word Hindu, initially by the Muslims, and they started interiorizing it first at the political level. The Vijayanaga rulers called themselves Hindu Suratrana, Suratrana being a Sanskritization of Sultan. The Marathas have the Hindu Padpa de Shahi, Hindu sovereignty. Uh, so they start using the word Hindu. In the British census, this is generalized. Now everybody uh, has to confess that he's a Hindu, every Hindu at least. Now, because of the influence of Christianity, which defines religion as a Loyalty to a specific religious doctrine. For example, you're a Christian if you believe in eternal sin, 
in Jesus' redemption from eternal sin, Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus dying on the cross and being resurrected. If you believe those things, you are a Christian. If you don't, then you're not a Christian. So many Hindus start thinking, oh, we also have to define Hindus. We have to articulate what precisely the contents of Hindu belief are. And in fact, you find that nowadays, you see, many Westerners who want to know about Hinduism will ask you, yeah, but what do you believe? You know, we believe in Jesus. What do you believe? And it's very difficult for Hindus to answer. Now, among these attempts, like one is by uh, Bala Ganga Dhara Tilak, you have a few fairly popular beliefs in India. Belief in the Vedas. Now, that excludes the tribals. That excludes the Jains. That excludes quite a few groups. Not the six. Six are entirely in the Vedic tradition. Um, belief in reincarnation. Again, that's not a defining belief in Hinduism. The Rishis never talk about reincarnation. Um, and in the Chandogya Upanishad, you have an explicit story of how the doctrine of reincarnation was introduced. And this to a fellow who has already received a full education in Vedanta, who knows about Atmavat, the doctrine of the self, the core of Vedantic uh, philosophy, and yet he doesn't know about reincarnation. Then he learns about reincarnation, right? So even the basis of Hindu philosophy doesn't require a belief in reincarnation. Even though today reincarnation is a very common belief among most Hindus, nevertheless, it's not a defining element of Hinduism. Cow protection, a similar thing. In ancient classics of Ayurveda, you have prescriptions about uh, what meat to eat if you have this or that disease. Um, there are claims by historians like D. and Jha that ancient texts contain clear indications that beef was eaten. Like there's some, some jocular remark by the famous Rishi uh, Yajna Valkya that yes, you know, he'll eat beef if it is properly prepared. And then the tribals and such, you know, marginal communities simply don't have this tradition of treating beef as a taboo. Then caste, okay, is caste defining for Hinduism? Well, no, the Vedic rishis did not have caste. Today you have Hindu communities outside India, like in the Netherlands, where they don't have caste anymore. And now among urban Hindus, many people are abandoning caste, are having inter-caste weddings, so, you know, I don't think caste is a defining element. There's also the fact that many non-Hindus in India also practice caste. Effectively, in Muslim society, you do have a continuation of caste. And in, in India, they've more or less been tutored not to say this, you know, to pretend that Islam as against Hinduism is egalitarian. In Pakistan, they have no such compunctions, they will uh, freely say, I am a Rajput Muslim, I am a Pandit Muslim. You know, usually the upper caste say that. You see, nobody says, I am a Chamar Muslim. <laughs> and so, you know, that sense of caste is, is, is still there. So anyway, I don't think any of these are really part of a good definition of Hindu. And the real definition is the original one. It's a negative definition. A Hindu is one who does not believe in Muhammad or in Jesus. So you see the idea, oh, Hindu means Vedic. You know, that's a very common assumption, but that's wrong. So nowadays, modern Hindus call their religion Sanatana Dharma. Hindu bashers disparage this as a modern coinage. They point out, and I think correctly, 
that Sanatana Dharma, as a name for Hinduism, did not exist before the 20th or at the very, very, very earliest before the 19th century. No, but the ancient term simply is Dharma. So Sanatana Dharma is not far off, you know. So Dharma is the correct term, <laughs> which usually people translate approximately as ethics or as righteousness. But so Dharma is a little bit more. Righteousness or ethics means the correct relation between you and others, you know, between human beings mutually or between creatures in general mutually. It's also towards animals and so on. In the case of Hinduism, more than in the case of Christianity or so. Uh, so it looks farther than just uh, the human race. But nevertheless, it's the correct relation with others. That's what we call ethics. By contrast, the correct relation with the divine, that's what we usually call religion. And so both these, the, the horizontal correctness and the vertical correctness, they both go into the Hindu concept of dharma. Now, Sanatana Dharma, well, that's something said by both the Mahabharata and the Buddha, and no doubt other ancient authorities, where they say this Dharma is Sanatana. So the Dharma that you know, the ethics, the religion that you know, that's not just for you, that is eternal. All your ancestors did it, all your descendants will do it. In the British period, this term Sanatana Dharma gets generalized, but there a Sanatani was usually understood as uh, a conservative Hindu in contrast with an Arya, which from the Arya Samaj was a reformist Hindu. So an Arya Samaj was against caste. A Sanatani Hindu was in favor of caste and of other conservative traditions like child marriage, like the prohibition on widow remarriage. And so these are things that Tilak, for example, stood for. Uh, so now that's, that's gone totally out of fashion, but at the time that was the meaning. So now, in fact, the word Sanatana is no longer uh, burdened with these connotations. So now it can fully be used. You see, Hinduism is Sanatana Dharma. One implication of this term eternal is that there is no founder. You can't find a founder of Hinduism. Even the Buddha, of course, doesn't claim to be a founder, not of Hinduism, but not even of Buddhism. The Buddha himself says that he's walking in the footsteps of earlier Buddhas. Mahavira Jina claims he's only the 24th of the Tirthankaras. And that series of Tirthankaras need not even be complete. Um, but so you could say, perhaps, that Adinata or Rasha Baldeva was the first Tirthankara and perhaps he was the founder of Jainism. But that's only one Sampradaya within Hinduism. He was not the founder of Hinduism. The first Vedic Rishi, Bharadvaj, or his patron Bharata, after whom India is named Bharat, um, again, were not the founders. The Vedas themselves speak about the earlier rishis. Even in the very first hymn of the Rig Veda, 111, no, 11, but maybe 112 or something. But so the first hymn of the first book, there is already talk about the rishis of today and the rishis of the past. So you see, immediately there is this consciousness that they are not bringing anything new. And so for Bharata, his ancestors are mentioned, Queen Ila and her father, King Manu, and so on. So this, this, this consciousness of being, being the new wave in an old stream, that's always there. So in this sense, you see, it's very correct to say uh, uh, Hinduism is Sanatana Dharma. And so this is a contrast with Christianity of Islam, which are totally unthinkable, which simply don't exist without their founders, Jesus or Muhammad. So that's why 
uh, to wind up. You see, that's something as a European that I insist on adding here. You see, Europe at the moment is going through a great crisis. Some people think that the dying religion of Christianity has to be brought back, whereas, of course, Europe existed for thousands of years before Christianity. It will exist after Christianity also. But it is true that we need some ideological backbone. Now, that is Sanatana Dharma. You see, this eternal righteousness, this is eternal sense of norms, of ethics, of all for the sacred, that should be brought back. Not in the form of a belief system with a specific doctrine, but in general as a, as a dharma, as an eternal dharma. Thank you.